The DCU is over. This has been the case since December of last year when we got Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. I had made a theory video discussing what the end of the DCU would look like through Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, and I was 100% wrong. And because of my disappointment of being wrong and how lackluster of an end to this world we had with not just how bad Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom was, but also because it ended this world on a joke and with no closure for any of the stories we had, that's where this video comes into play. I failed in predicting how the DCU would end. So I wanted to take the time to create my own story of how the DCU should have ended. So welcome to Big Flick Energy and let's get right into it. This film that I'll be calling Justice League Antilife would deal with the ends of all the stories left in the DCU with open-ended conclusions we probably will never get to explore. This includes the Justice Society comprised of Superman, Shazam, Hawkman, Cyclone, and Adam Smasher, and we know Superman and Shazam were part of this team in a way because at the end of Black Adam we see Superman, and at the end of Fury of the Gods we see Shazam, both of them have a connection to this team. Superman's long-awaited battle against Black Adam, George Clooney's Batman, who is the new Batman of this world at the end of The Flash, Martian Manhunter's arrival into this world that we see at the end of the Snyder Cut, Aquaman unveiling Atlantis of the world that we see at the end of Aquaman 2, the original Blue Beetle finding a way back home that they led to at the end of the Blue Beetle film, Mr. Mind's attempt to conquer the Seven Realms alongside Dr. Savannah, which they showed at the end of both Shazam 1 and 2, the Amazonian Asteria still being alive, which they showed at the end of Wonder Woman 2, and the arrival of Darkseid to Earth, which we saw at the end of Zack Snyder's Justice League, which will all come to fruition in Justice League and to the life. So once again, let's get right into it. The movie starts with Mr. Mind opening a portal to free Dr. Savannah from his cell, as Mr. Mind has conquered six of the seven realms and it is time to conquer the Earthlands. But first, they need to get Savannah back his powers. The next scene shows the Justice League getting ready to meet, as this is taking place soon after the events of Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, and is an emergency meeting being held by then to discuss Arthur's announcement to the world of the presence of Atlantis. Because there hadn't been an emergency meeting needed in a while, this is the first time the full Justice League is together since before the events of Flash. So the League will include the members of George Clooney Batman, Flash, Cyborg, Aquaman, Wonder Woman, and Martian Manhunter. Notice Ben Affleck's Batman and Henry Cavill's Superman are not in this group. Flash will be asking the important questions to Arthur about who Martian Manhunter is, where he'll remember Bruce telling him about him but that before he wasn't a member of the team. He'll ask where Superman is, where Arthur will explain that after they revived Superman and killed Steppenwolf, Superman saw that move as reckless and something that if Lois weren't there, could have resulted in another global threat. So he decided to leave the team and join Amanda Waller's Justice Society. Because Waller created the Justice Society, she disbanded the Task Force X program since she now had a team of metas under her control. This team comprises of Hawkman, Cyclone, Adam Smasher, a new Doctor Fate, Superman, and the Shazam family, but this team is only brought together when needed. He also asked the room if nobody noticed anything different with Batman, to which Bruce tells Barry to stop it, it's going to be a comedic scene seeing those interactions between George Clooney's Batman and The Flash. Eventually, the entire team will discuss what happened with Arthur unveiling Atlantis to the world where Bruce mentions Atlantis will now need a king more than ever with other nations learning of their capabilities. Arthur believes he's being kicked out of the team, to which he eventually gets mad and says he'll leave and be the full-time king and father, leaving the Justice League another member down. When leaving the meeting, Martian Manhunter talks to Flash because he realizes Flash does not recognize him by reading his mind. He looks into Flash's mind to see everything he went through in the events of his own film and apologizes for having to go through that. Flash now likes Martian Manhunter, but Martian Manhunter knows Flash is going to try to find Superman because he feels as if something bad is going to happen soon if they don't act fast, and this new Batman is just breaking off their relationship to Aquaman and Atlantis, and that's not a good way forward. 
Flash decides to zoom over to Clark's house in Smallville, where pregnant Lois resides. Lois is happy to see Flash, but tells him that Clark is at the Justice Society facility. So Flash then goes over there, but realizes the facility has a metal blocker shield, so to continue in, he can't use his abilities. We then cut to the Justice Society meeting with Waller to discuss how many expected casualties without their help there would have been in different areas and areas of potential improvement alongside the mention of a potential new candidate to join the team, Blue Beetle. However, while at this meeting, Hawkman asks Billy's family where Billy is and they say he's late again but should be on his way. This is where we cut to a scene of Billy trying to finish a summer school homework assignment before the clock strikes 5.59pm, which is the submittal time and Billy asks why the submittal is at such a random time. We cut back to the Justice Society, which is when they begin discussing the data and Blue Beetle as a potential member, and also why the other Shazam family members are at the meeting if they're just kids and only have powers with Billy. They'll also mention how there was another Blue Beetle in an older version of the Justice Society, which is a story point that we'll come back to later on. Amanda Waller cuts off the conversation and tells the team the moment they feared has come, that Black Adam has left Kandak. Superman tells the rest of the team he can handle this threat, as this is why he was actually brought in as part of the team, to handle threats to his own level. He arrives at the scene and sees Black Adam looking over the city and asks him if he's looking for something and that he thought he told him to stay in contact. Black Adam responds saying he needs to be here and that Superman can't stop him from what needs to be done and that they are actually on the same side. Superman asks what the threat is and Black Adam says he doesn't know yet but to just let him handle it. Superman says he can't let him do that and puts a hand on him. Black Adam takes his hand off and shoots him with lightning and says to let him handle it, which will at this point result in a fight between Superman and Black Adam, a fight we've been wanting to see for a long time. Eventually, Superman is about to win the fight, but Shazam holds him back and says this other guy, Black Adam, isn't lying and that while they were fighting, whatever Black Adam was here for started. Shazam introduces himself and says that they have a mutual friend, the Wizard. When they get back to where Black Adam was standing, six portals have been opened with creatures coming out of each of them from the six realms. Now, I just want to explain six of the seven realms. They are heavily based on what the comics show. So some of these characters are going to sound very strange, like Alice in Wonderland is in this, and that's very strange, but that was a part of the comics. So just want to give that closure on that story point. But also for a couple of these worlds, I'm going to try to go deeper into what we've seen in the DCEU to try to give Easter eggs to the past and connect it into the actual comics for this. So the creatures coming out of the six portals are the Black Adam zombies, the Lost Kingdom zombies, undead Kryptonians from the Battle of Man of Steel, undead Parademons from Justice League, undead Suicide Squad members like Polka Dot Man, Captain Boomerang, and Javelin, an undead White Dragon, and the undead Poison Ivy, Bane, and Mr. Freeze from George Clooney's Batman and Robin, all led by Jeepers from the Darklands. An army of winged flying monkeys, the Witch's soldiers, and the card soldiers from Alice in Wonderland, led by the Wicked Witch of the West from the Wazenderlands. An army of monsters reminiscent of the monsters from the Night of the Monster Men, DC Comics, led by Tateno from the Monsterlands, an army of anthropomorphic animals similar to King Shark and Man Bat, led by the Crocodile Men from the Wildlands, an army of basic video game shooter characters that look like they belong in a game fusion of Fortnite, Ghost of Tsushima, and Halo to not get copyrighted, so we're just gonna make insane characters that could belong in a dystopian samurai game in the future that for some reason includes pickaxes like Fortnite led by a character from Mortal Kombat, where, as many people know, DC and Mortal Kombat have a very strong, long-standing relationship. So having a video game character lead this team, I think that would be really cool to see in this world. And I think that character should be Sub-Zero, who would be leading the game lands. And an army of clowns and circus characters led strong men and fire breathers led by Mr. Merry-Go-Round from the Funlands. And also, if we are never going to get William Dafoe as the Joker, 
This is the time to make a Joker-like character in the DC universe be played by William Defoe. Make him one of these clowns. Make him Mr. Merigarone. Why not? And finally, Dr. Savannah from the Earthlands. Superman and Shazam send out a dispatch to Justice Society base to help fight off this threat alongside Black Adam. When Justice Society's ship is taking off to go to the battle site, Flash sees it from the lobby of the facility waiting to speak with them and instantly runs out of the building to catch up to the ship. As he gets closer and sees where the Justice Society is going, he puts in a dispatch with the Justice League who says they are already on their way. The Justice Society arrives with Flash first and continue taking on the threat and Black Adam states the wizard told him the only way to stop the armies from coming was to defeat their leaders on both sides and their true king. When the Justice League arrive, they feel comfortable in the amount of support they have on this side fighting where they can send individuals into each of the other six realms to defeat their leaders there. Where pretty much there's one leader that's leading the armies to the Earthlands and there's one leader that stayed behind for each of these portals. So they send Superman to the Darklands and remind him that everybody in the Darklands is actually dead already, so any level of force necessary is fine. He just needs to get this job done. So in this sequence, we will actually be able to see a very brutal Superman who will face against the undead Doomsday as his final boss in the Darklands. Cyclone, who will face the Red Queen in the Wazenderlands. Dr. Fate, who will face off against the Evil Eye in the Monsterlands. Hawkman, who will face off against Scapegoat in the Wildlands, Cyborg, who will face off against Mr. Adam in the Gamelands, and Batman, who will face off against King Cole and his uncle, the former King Cole, in the Funlands. This leaves Wonder Woman, Flash, Martian Manhunter, Adam Smasher, who will need to take on Titano, the giant ape that shoots kryptonite beams through his eyes because he can match his size for a kaiju battle, and then also Shazam and his family and Black Adam. When Superman is in the Darklands destroying everybody, he stops for a moment because one person looks normal and not undead. The man tells Superman his name and that he got stuck in here and that he finally got a signal out so he thought that this was a rescue mission. This is where he states his name to be Ted Kord, the former Blue Beetle. After eventually defeating Doomsday who is the last boss before they take down Savannah, they then defeat Savannah and ask him where Mr. Mind is but he himself has no idea. Now, before I continue with the story, I do want to say that we will actually not see the final moments of any of the six battles in these other lands. Because for the story that I'm trying to tell, where it's kind of a mystery of who is actually working with Darkseid, that story won't work if you see any of the victors in the battles in the respective realms. So pretty much we're going to leave that up to the imagination of the viewer. We're going to give the majority of the fight, we just won't see the end of the fights. So now back to the story. Ted Kord, Blue Beetle, explains that he has some information that may help in finding Mr. Mind, and when he was in the Darklands, he came across many horrible villains from his own past, but also from the world's past. But they seemed mindless and as if they weren't in control, all except for one, Steppenwolf. He spoke to Steppenwolf, who explained that Mr. Mind has been seeking the Seven Realms to test the Anti-Life Equation on behalf of Darkseid. Back when Darkseid came to Earth for the first time, after departing the planet, he went to Venus given research on the race of Mr. Mind, where they acted as a hive mind of sorts, where when one dies, the rest attain the knowledge and intelligence that one held. Darkseid used Mr. Mind as a backup plan, stripping him out of the world and nuking it leaving Mr. Mind as its only survivor and the holder of all knowledge and intelligence of Venus. With an intellect like this, he would be able to solve Antilife. He actually eventually did solve it by analyzing how a hive mind like his planet works based off his species biology from Venus, but he had yet to solve the part of the equation that there is no future outside of death, but realized all of those within the Darklands already understand this so that part of the equation had already been solved there. Now, just for some explanation of what the anti-life equation is, it pretty much gives this one entity that states the anti-life equation control over all the people that hear it. And trying to solve the anti-life equation can give control over the entire multiverse if you're able to solve it. And this is ultimately what Dark Side's goal is, and that's why 
Mr. Mind was able to use the hive mind as research to try to see how he can control everybody else's mind, but then also needing to know that death is the only finality in life. So the equation actually did work in the Darklands, apart from Steppenwolf, who understood how the Darklands worked and that a worse fate than death is serving Darkseid. So he wasn't turned. Mr. Mind was able to use the army of the Darklands to bring death to the other realms, leading to the planetary belief that the only future was death. So they ultimately succumbed to anti-life. And this brings us back to where we are with the Earthlands defeating Mr. Mind's army and defeating anti-life. For now. In knowing this, Superman stated he had heard of anti-life before from the Kryptonian ship, but hasn't been back since the events of the first Justice League film. As they arrive at the ship, Mr. Mind is talking to a hologram of Darkseid and tells him he has sent the coordinates of the planet and has solved the anti-life equation. Darkseid declares the ships have been prepared and are ready to conquer this new world and retrieve anti-life. As Mr. Mind is grabbed by Superman, he states he has completed his mission and uses his legs to rip himself open, killing himself. As Superman returns back to where all the heroes were, he explains what happened. But Batman questions what just occurred given Darkseid needs Mr. Mind to tell him the anti-life equation, meaning Mr. Mind needs to have kept record of it. Savannah, who realizes he was being played by Mr. Mind, is willing to help and says Mr. Mind sees physical records as primitive and below him given how he reacted in the end credits of the first Shazam to Dr. Savannah writing on the walls of the prison cell. This is when Batman checks in and connects the dots Satan, it must be kept in a database. And then given what Ted Kord mentioned of Mr. Mind's research for the anti-life equation being based on his own species' hive mind, what if the anti-life equation is now stored in the mind of somebody who has succumbed to anti-life, that's the database, and is part of anti-life's hive mind, and given Darkseid is coming to this realm, it must be somebody who has succumbed and is still on Earth. So this is where the mystery aspect comes into play. The group starts questioning who could have succumbed, and it's evident it must have been one of the members to have gone to one of the other realms and discover there that death is the only meaning. And it must be a character amongst Batman, Superman, Hawkman, Dr. Fate, Cyborg, or Cyclone, since those were the characters to go to the other worlds. Martian Manhunter states he can see their minds for the anti-life equation. As he's exploring their minds, he sees he cannot see through Cyborg, Batman, or Dr. Fate because of the defenses they have built against Mind Tricks. They continue discussing and realize Savannah was a follower of Mr. Mind. But Martian Manhunter reads his mind and sees it wasn't him. But when they go back to questioning Fate, Batman, and Cyborg rather than being able to read their minds, it appears Dr. Fate has actually teleported away from the scene, pretty much leading to the belief that it is Dr. Fate. The team dismantles after this to Team A to use their resources to try and find Dr. Fate and Team B recruit other heroes and villains for the fight that is coming against Darkseid. But also Team C visit their loved ones before they go to war, especially in the case of Ted Kord who goes to see his daughter and Clark who goes to see Lois who is pregnant with their child. This leads to Bruce getting mad first at Clark and saying how Superman left the league because bringing him back from the dead was too great of a risk, and that now he's taking an even bigger risk by leaving them in this fight. Clark says he'll be back soon and flies off. Now when Ted Kord says he, seeing his daughter's his priority, it actually triggers Batman to say his priorities are in the wrong place, and they can be with their families later. This moment sets up a history between Bruce Wayne and Ted Kord where Ted exclaims that just because Bruce gave up his family doesn't mean he has to do the same. This will lead to an interaction among Bruce, Diana, and Barry after Ted leaves and they are back at Justice League headquarters planning for an attack against Darkseid and the recruits they need. The Justice League and Justice Society are split up into two teams. Batman, Wonder Woman, Cyborg, Atom Smasher, Cyclone, Black Adam. And the other team, Hawkman, Martian Manhunter, the Shazam family, and Flash. In the discussion among Flash, Wonder Woman, and Batman, which is before Flash leaves to join the other team, Bruce explains what Cord meant, explaining the basics of what happened in Batman and Robin the movie 
and then delving into how after the death of Alfred, he turned his back away from Dick and Barbara. They became their own heroes, but they were all a part of the original Justice Society of America alongside Blue Beetle, The Atom, who we met in Black Adam, Asteria from the Wonder Woman 1984 post credit scene, which obviously makes Wonder Woman react given she told us about her story in her film, and Batman, Robin, and Batgirl. Wonder Woman asked why she wasn't a part of the team if she was already around, and Bruce says she was a very difficult person to reach, and he had been trying to find her for a while before they met during the events of Batman vs Superman. With that though, Bruce and Diana now have targets to acquire for their team, and Bruce sends Adam Smasher and Cyclone after Drake Grayson Nightwing and Barbara Gordon Batwoman, so he can stay strategizing for the upcoming war. Wonder Woman goes after Asteria, in which they will then go together to Themyscira to bring their sisters to the fight. Cyborg and Black Adam will travel together to Atlantis for them to aid in this fight as well. Before Flash goes back to the other team to discuss how to find Dr. Fate, he tells Bruce the truth of why he reacted the way he did after the trial for his dad and mentions the advice his Bruce, Ben Affleck Bruce, gave him and leaves it with Clooney Batman. The other team's first scene will show Hawkman getting off call with Amanda Waller, saying they're going to need to call back in Task Force X for the upcoming fight when Flash comes in. When they get off call, the team begins strategizing how to find Dr. Fate, with Shazam mentioning he spoke with a wizard who told him the Doctor resides in a realm outside of time and space that acts as a nexus point to all realities known as the Tower of Fate. This is where Flash realizes it's kind of like the Chromosphere from his own film and believes he can actually get to the Tower through the Chromosphere, but he would only be able to go by himself. But he also doesn't know exactly what he's looking for when he's there. Here's when Martian Manhunter comes into play and mentions when he was looking through all of their minds to see who had been succumbed, he saw a tower protecting the mind of fate. Martian Manhunter connects his mind to Flash's to show him the tower and Flash goes into the chronosphere as he loses his connection with Martian Manhunter, but already has the image of the tower ingrained into his mind. So he eventually finds it within this area outside of time and space, and he finds it within the chronosphere and enters. As he enters, he searches for fate within the tower and will eventually find him, and when he finds him, they will have a big battle and fate will explain simply the reason he agreed that death is the only ending is because death is fate. After he finishes what he says, he realizes he solved the first part of the anti-life equation which results in a fight between Dr. Fate and Flash, where Flash is attempting to defeat him before he can finish saying the full equation, and eventually Flash does defeat him, removing the helmet from him. But the full anti-life equation has now been solved. The man under the helmet, Khalid Nasser, is not under anti-life, and it is actually just the helmet of Naboo. Barry travels back to the Justice Society base with the helmet and says Darkseid is now coming for war because the anti-life is gone. Now we cut back over to another story point in Bloodhaven, which is where Nightwing resides. When Cyclone arrives at Bloodhaven to get Nightwing, he is evidently mad Bruce couldn't even come himself after all this time and refuses to go until we see Barbara's Batwoman walk up with Adam Smasher, saying to not do it for Bruce, but that the world needs them to be heroes. Now we cut over to Wonder Woman meeting Asteria where they show they have a bond over their similar stories and love they share for Themyscira, and Asteria is very willing to help, but also asks Wonder Woman if she still has her armor. We see alluding to the fact that later on in this film we will see Asteria back in that armor. We then see Cyborg and Black Adam have some banter while going to Atlantis, and they speak to Aquaman who tells them if this threat is real, hiding in the shadows may be the only way his own people can stay safe for now so he won't be able to help in this battle. He's not a hero for the world anymore, he's a hero for his people. Now while all these events are happening, Superman will go to where the Justice League was situated when game planning, which was in the Kryptonian ship as Batman is running through all data on Darkseid, Parademons, the Anti-Life Equation, etc. and how to counter it. Batman and Superman will have an inspirational conversation here as they recount their history and Clark asks if this is how Bruce actually made all those kryptonite weapons so long ago, the weapons that he used in Batman vs Superman. 
The conversation will eventually get to Bruce apologizing to Clark, and he says he's going to have to do a much bigger apology now as Nightwing, Batwoman, Adam Smasher, and Cyclone enter the room, leading to a hug shared between Batman and Batwoman. But Nightwing ignores Batman for the most part until we'll later see Batman by himself and Nightwing calls him out where they'll have another deep talk at that moment. We'll also see Diana and Asteria returning to Themyscira and are first met with military force as the Amazons begin fighting against Diana and Asteria as trespassers until Diana's mother sees them and calls off the battle. This moment will be reminiscent of the Bible story of the father and the two sons where he welcomed his son home after betraying him. Hippolyta will mention what Diana did against Steppenwolf and will bring up Asteria and who she was and is to Themyscira. Eventually, Diana will mention they wouldn't have come if it wasn't an emergency, and that Darkseid is coming and they need the armies of Man, Themyscira, and Atlantis to unite once more to defeat him. We will also see Ted Kord see his daughter and meet the new Blue Beetle, Jaime Reyes. The conversation the three of them are having will start off wholesome until Jaime starts asking a lot of questions of how he came back and why he isn't helping in the war that is about to come if he knows of it. So Ted Kord sort of plays it off and saying that he wants to be with family, but at this point Jaime says that he's seen his family now and there's a time for everything in life. And that his family won't be here if the war happens. He actually begins to question Ted Kord's true nature as a hero and threatens him, telling Jenny this isn't her dad. At this moment, we actually see Ted begin to fight against Jaime until Jaime is punched outside of the house and we see parademons flying around with Darkseid's ship lowering in, as Darkseid has come to claim his anti-life equation, which is now held by Ted Kord Blue Beetle, who has succumbed to the anti-life the entire film without us knowing. So because of this, the final battle in this film will take place on Palmera City, the exact area that the entire Blue Beetle film took place in. As Darkseid's army is landing though, and Blue Beetle starts fighting off against Parademons and Ted Kord at the same time, the heroes begin arriving with Superman, Batman, Nightwing, Batwoman, Cyborg, Black Adam, the Shazam family, Hawkman, The Flash, Cyclone, and Atom Smasher. The next tandem will be Suicide Squad members including Deadshot, Harley Quinn who also helped call in Huntress and Black Canary from her own film, King Shark, Bloodsport, Ratcatcher, Killer Croc, Katana, Peacemaker, and the US Army. The next tandem will be Wonder Woman, Asteria, and the Amazons. And the final tandem later on in the battle will be Aquaman with Atlantis, as Aquaman says he decided to help because he already announced Atlantis to the world, so his dumb decision means they can't hide out forever anymore. Mira, on the other hand, will stay back to protect her child for obvious reasons unrelated to Mira herself. Now, Aquaman comes out of the ocean on top of Karathan, the beast from the first Aquaman movie, setting up for another kaiju battle in this film. I'm not sure who he's gonna fight against from Darkseid's end, but I feel like there is a character within DC lore that you can bring in for Karathan to fight. Also, because this final fight does take place in Palmera City, which is based on Miami, having the Amazons come by boat and the Atlanteans just pop up next to the fight is very feasible. So at the beginning of the battle, Darkseid is relying on his army. However, he eventually gets out of his ship to get to Ted Kord himself to get the anti-life equation instead of relying on his army of parademons or relying on Desad, Granny Goodness, Calabac, or Mantis leader of his own army of humanoid insects. This scene is reminiscent of Thanos going after the final Infinity Stone to snap, but instead in trying to get to Ted Kord. To get there, he's fighting through all the heroes we've known and is killing some of them as he begins to kill off King Shark, Martian Manhunter, Black Canary, and Cyborg to get there. Because this is the last film in this world, this film is going to be a massacre, I just want to let you guys know and a lot of that massacre is going to be because of Darkseid. We really want to show how powerful Darkseid is in this film and how many characters he takes out. When he's finally in front of Ted, Wonder Woman swoops in and kills Ted Kord before Darkseid can connect with him to receive the anti-life equation. As Ted dies, he tells Darkseid the Helmet of Fate 
knows the equation and points up at the Justice Society ship which holds the helmet. Darkseid jumps to go and get it. Wonder Woman grabs his leg with the lasso of truth and Darkseid comes back down and steps on her, breaking all her ribs. He then tries to jump back up and gets tackled by Black Adam on the jump up. Darkseid tells Black Adam he sees darkness within him and he can rule by his side. But Black Adam says he already has a kingdom and they begin to fight as the Shazam family pops in to help in the fight. Darkseid defeats the entire family and Black Adam and shoots his laser eyes to kill Black Adam. But the lasers are met by beams from the other side, Superman's. Now, we'll have Superman vs. Darkseid, which will be a hard fought battle, and Batman will also come in after Superman is down, where he'll be able to outmaneuver Darkseid's beams somehow, which will impress Darkseid. But Batman will die in this fight, as his final moments will be with Nightwing and Batwoman standing over him, with him apologizing for the way he treated them. The battle between Superman and Darkseid continues as Superman gets back up and says he just needed to distract Darkseid for long enough as Hawkman is carrying the helmet flying away from the ship. Darkseid shoots his Omega Beams at him and clips his wings as he falls to the ground. He tries squirming away as Darkseid approaches and we see Superman fly back in and try to stop Darkseid from getting the helmet, but Darkseid kills Hawkman with his own mace, pushing him all the way to Aquaman. Aquaman sees this and Superman comes to get Aquaman's trident, as Superman stabs Darkseid through the chest with the trident. Darkseid is temporarily down and shrugs Superman off. He takes the trident out of his chest and stabs Aquaman with it, who is helping Superman push it through Darkseid. As Aquaman is stabbed, he is also killed. He then goes back to get the helmet and sees Hawkman doesn't have it anymore, but it's Harley Quinn who is running away with it. As Darkseid approaches to take the helmet, she puts it on, releasing a blast that sends Darkseid flying. She has a quick interaction with Fate, who says she's not a worthy host, and forces the helmet off of her. Superman comes up and takes the helmet from her, but Darkseid comes back and shoots Omega Beams through Harley and goes to fight against Superman again. He defeats Superman, who is on the floor with the helmet, but Superman shoots a blast to make an open line, taking out all parademons in that path after saying, I hope plan B works, Bruce, a line that will have become a meme if this film were ever made, and then hands the helmet off to Barry as he shouts out, Run, Barry, run. Darkseid stomps on Superman's head and shoots his Omega Beams at Barry that are slowly catching up to him. But Barry pushes through and arrives back in the Chronosphere before getting hit. Barry goes to the Tower of Fate, but the helmet tells Barry there is no changing what may happen. What is happening is destined to be. It is fate. This is when Barry realizes the helmet is claiming what he knows to be true of time travel, that there are fixed points in time. And for his world, it appears that Darkseid's conquest is a fixed point in time. He begins having a deep philosophical conversation with fate about how far back would things need to change for fate to change, where fate says it depends on the event. Barry goes back and undoes what he did in his own movie with moving the can of tomatoes to the top shelf. He travels back to the final battle and sees Batfleck along a green lantern, both dead on the floor and Superman calling for him to get the helmet with the same plan so he travels back to the Tower of Fate. He tries to go back in time even further and will see the event that occurred in Batman vs Superman where he travels to the wrong time and sees Ben Affleck Batman. He then goes back even further to go to the point he actually wanted to go to and when he gets to that point and he tells Bruce something specific and he goes back to the future, he sees the Nightmare Timeline. After seeing the Nightmare Timeline, he decides to go back in time once again. At this point, he realizes he needs to reset the entire timeline, and he can't try to play these games. And he has to reset it from the beginning because Darkseid's conquest is not limited to his world, but to the multiverse itself. If he can reset his world, he can save the entire multiverse. He creates another flashpoint by going back, and the screen fades to white, as he goes out crying and screaming, and the credits begin to roll. Now, this will lead into an end credit scene where we go to a farmhouse in the middle of Smallville and overhear a woman telling her son, 
good luck in his interview, and that Metropolis isn't ready for the legacy Clark is about to make. We hear Clark chuckle and say he loves her as he opens the door, and we see David Cornsweat come out, and the screen cuts to black and says, Superman will return. So for this film, I actually did take Avengers Endgame as a big inspiration. Even though I'm not particularly the biggest fan of Endgame, I'm actually a much bigger fan of Infinity War. And I took Endgame as inspiration because of the formatting of the story. So I want the first act to be where we see the entire team fight against Mr. Mind and try to solve who the first person to have been succumbed by the anti-life is so that they can then go into the second phase where all these characters are trying to recruit new members to the team and prepare for the war against Darkseid. And also we see Flash go against Dr. Fate. And then this leads directly into the third act where we'll see that Blue Beetle had also been succumbed to the anti-F equation. And this is where we'll see the massive fight between Darkseid and the entire team of heroes. Now, who would I bring in on as the team behind this film? So I actually believe executive producers should be James Gunn, Peter Safran. And while as of late, I've not liked what this man has been saying about DC, about his own films. I would also bring in Zack Snyder as this was Zack's original vision. And he would be able to bring back actors like Henry Cavill, Ben Affleck and Ray Fisher to do this film. However, I would not have Snyder direct the film as with his slow-mo scenes, this film has so much going on and it would end up being a six hour film. Instead, I would actually have Gareth Edwards, director of the creator and Rogue One take on the film. On the writing side, I would bring in Rodney Rothman who co-wrote Into and Beyond the Spider-Verse, Ernie Altbacker who co-wrote Justice League Apocalypse War, and Chris Terrio as the writer's room lead who co-wrote Zack Snyder's Justice League and Batman vs Superman, as although his films haven't been the most popular, he most definitely will keep the vibe of the previous films in the story. And you know what? Bring me into the writer's room as well. It is my idea, so might as well sneak into the room. Next up, let's bring in the same stunt choreography team from Snyder's previous films because the fight scenes were some of the strongest aspects of films like Batman vs Superman and Man of Steel. And we wanted to have a level of brutality to the fights we haven't seen since films like that. Obviously, we've had Peacemaker, The Suicide Squad, Birds of Prey, but watching those fight sequences, it's very bloody and gory, but I don't feel like they're actually pushing a lot of brutality and you don't feel weight to the punches that these characters are throwing. I don't know if it makes sense what I'm saying, but just watching the fights in Man of Steel, and even the Wonder Woman fight sequence in Zack Snyder's Justice League, I felt weight when I was watching those fights. And that's what I want to feel for Justice League Anti-Life. And lastly, for the score of the film, I would love to bring back Hans Zimmer to fuse his Man of Steel theme with the Justice League animated score. Which I might be a little bit biased because I grew up watching the Justice League animated series but it is a great score, and if you can fuse Man of Steel with that score, I think that would be beautiful. Now, with this team and this story, I believe Justice League Antilife could be an incredible film that closes out this chapter of DC very well by closing out all the stories we saw left unfinished from the DCU and also establishing why this world cannot continue and needs to be rebooted with an in-universe explanation. It won't be a happy ending like Endgame was, but you don't want it to be a copy of that film. You want it to be its own story, and while Thanos chasing the gauntlet is a similar story arc to Darkseid chasing the helmet, they lead to very different paths to take the story on, which I think is what holds value in this film. Happy endings are great, but overdone in superhero films. This is why Infinity War is my favorite of the MCU films, and Endgame is actually one I consider overrated. I want to make sure this film doesn't feel like a cheap solution to ending this world and give a valid reason for why it must end. I want it to give a proper closure to all the open-ended storylines the DCU left outside of Peacemaker since that's getting a season 2 and it's already confirmed that Peacemaker season 1 isn't actually canon. With that though, we have how I believe the DCU should have ended through the film Justice League Anti-Life. 
It will sadly never get made and this world is gone forever. Well, until James Gunn chooses to bring the characters back through the multiverse. But I was happy to create this story that hopefully gets the right people and maybe, just maybe, lead to direct to Max DC Elseworlds film. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! Although it's unlikely, if you want to help on our journey to getting this story to James Gunn, spread the word. Comment on this video with your thoughts, how it can improve, and what you guys think the best way to get this video to James Gunn would be, and your excitement level for James Gunn's new DC universe and his Superman film coming out in 2025. If you're interested in more videos like this, I have a full channel of DCU videos and original stories like my Spider-Man trilogy storyline, the Nintendo Cinematic Universe storyline, and how I would have continued the DCU if it were a continuous storyline, not this one film to end it. So with that, you should check those out. Thanks again, and see you next time on Big Flick Energy.